This is the Real Estate Shop, where each episode will bring you a top industry expert to share their current programs or projects that are making an impact in our communities today. Be sure to check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Stephanie, thanks for thanks for making time to, to speak with Steve and I. Um, won't you start by letting the audience know about what you do and, and who you are and um, what we'll take it from there? Sure. Thanks, Kervin. I appreciate being here. I am a managing director of uh, Originations for National Equity Fund, which is a national not-for-profit syndicator. And we basically place deals with investors, um, always affordable. I cover the Mid-Atlantic, which is D.C., Virginia, um, obviously Maryland, as well as Pennsylvania. So, you know, pretty big footprint for us. We're just focused on making sure that our investors get the right yield and make sure that our developers get the right price. And how did you get to uh, where you are today? Sure. I started um, in community development in 06. Um, so I've been doing a long time. I started off in Boston and Bank America as an analyst and um, was in Boston for a few years, moved out to New York, did our first few supportive housing projects out in New York, uh, covered the Northeast from there, moved out to Los Angeles, covered the West Coast, um, did a, a lot of supportive housing. Obviously, this is a time where, you know, we had a formerly homeless, mentally ill was a big focus uh, for the West region. So um, also focused on a lot of red uh, conversions. So a lot of experience there as well. Then I moved to DC and I covered charter schools for the bank nationally, where we were focused on basically the three pillars of what we see community development banking as, which was housing, um, jobs, right? And then school for kids in those neighborhoods. So um, focused on charter schools for a few years, moved back up to Boston, and then um, focused on New York region, affordable housing, and found myself looking for something else and ended up at National Equity Fund as of last October. Wow, pretty, pretty awesome. How do you feel about homeless, the homeless? Because that's still a, a big issue, right? You mentioned Los Angeles and the Northeast. Yeah. It's like... Yeah, it's a huge issue. I mean, even in D.C., honestly, Kevin, from the last time I was living in D.C., it's kind of crazy to see the tents and, you know, how much has changed. Um, and I think it puts in perspective, you know, how much people are living paycheck to paycheck, right? Because there's a lot more families on the streets, uh, a lot more younger um, adults and children, which is really sad to see. And I think, you know, instead of improving, even though everybody has the intention to make affordable housing accessible, there's such a need. Right. And I think the challenge is always trying to figure out um, the right time to hit the market and making sure that people don't necessarily suffer from uh, NIMBYism, which is obviously not in my backyard. So, you know, I think that's part of the challenge, but I, I wish we could do more. And I think the the big thing is really the supportive component of permanent supportive housing that makes mm -hmm. that that housing product successful. And you mean the wraparound services, right? The social Absolutely. care. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people with mental illness that if they don't have those services, even if you did provide housing, they're not going to stay there, right? If you're suffering from schizophrenia, why would you stay in a in a place you feel paranoid about or, you know, something that is like very significant that you need a caseworker for, but you don't have health insurance because in this country, if you don't have a job, you don't have health insurance, you can't access medical. Um, so it, it's a really downhill spiral for folks. And I think that wraparound service is huge because not only do they get medication needed, job placement um, for where you at, or, or even like people coming out of jail, right? Like there's, those services are so important to folks to basically land softly right. um, versus like, you know, pick it up and try to get it done. Yeah. And, you know, we do market studies and one of the things we, when we interview people that are um, uh, living without a home, They'll say, well, I, I don't go to I don't want to go to a shelter because I have a child. And, you know, there are cases where something may happen or the threat of something happening to the child. Um, so we, we hear that for as a reason why people choose to stay on the street, which is, you know, you think about it as being kind of like odd. But, you know, if they find more comfort where they are. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, honestly, I was in New York um, recently, uh, like yourself, Kirvin, and literally was talking to someone who ran the homeless shelters and they were saying like kids would die in those shelters. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a common thing. And a lot of people don't put that out there, obviously, for obvious reasons. But I think that's an important factor to consider when you're talking about where parents feel safe. And adults, like families, they, they can't stay together, right? Mm -hmm. So adults have to be one place and then women and children have to be in a separate place. So, you know, when people are kind of deciding how to be safest, you know, and I think that's the big thing is basically trying to stay together. 
Um, so living in cars, maybe even, you know, obviously I think we should also include couch surfing for people who are staying with families and like, you know, generations and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of hardship in families nowadays. You got, you do a lot of work with uh, for-profit and non-for-profit developers, uh, Stephanie. We do. Yeah. Yeah. National Equity Fund does not, you know, have a preference for one or the other, but we do have a preference for mission-driven. So if you are for-profit, obviously we'd hope that um, you're going to maintain the affordability of the project, right? We have a preservation product that a lot of developers are interested in, making sure that um, after the 15-year compliance period that the project maintains affordability. And I think the important thing is, even if you're going to work for, for with a for-profit developer, that they are mission-driven to maintain that affordability. Because, you know, I think it, the number is like pretty high in terms of how many units annually are being lost um, after year 15. Exactly. But like any other investor, you guys looking to pack your bags around year 15 or so, and whatever happens, happens at that point. Yeah. Um, and that's like not, you know, that's not the intention of this, right? Like we don't go through all that effort for it to be done in 15 years, right? And you'd, you'd hope at least it has an extended use period, so. Exactly. Yeah, it's, and, um, yeah, you, it's an interesting point with the wraparound services. I know a lot of the QAPs address it, but in Philadelphia, for instance, you know, we don't have the ability to get project-based vouchers. So we can't really dip into that 30% AMI pool. Whereas DC, you know, if you're doing housing reduction trust fund money, you know, I think five or ten percent they'll give you a uh, voucher. So uh, every everybody's different, uh, but there is a, a huge need. Are, are you seeing deals that are basically your typical sixty percent AMI, with most of it being sixty percent AMI, or you, you see? I mean, it's a it's a good point, Steve, that you make. Like every region is so different, right? Yeah. Like what you can play with is so critical, and you know what we're finding in today's market is that more and more developers are coming up against gaps, huge gaps, right? You have yeah. to integrate your construction escalated way beyond yep. what you budgeted your interest rates way higher so you can afford lower perm debt and right. then at the end of the day like your yield is higher the requirement of your investors while your tax credit pricing is lower so your your deals are so skinny that anything okay. like even the utility costs going up will right. impact whether or not you can convert and that's yep. i mean you know you're, you're playing too many things at once right we're at the we're exactly. at the point where it's like it feels overwhelming to try to solve those problems and yeah. I think it's why, in my opinion, a lot of like developers who have deep pockets can weather the storm better than some of the smaller not-for-profits that, you know, they've been in the neighborhood a long time, they've been doing their work, but it seems right. kind of like their pockets aren't as deep because they're focused on the services, right? They're focused on, yeah. you know, making sure that people have a home over their head and all those kind of things. But it's it's a really difficult time to basically be doing this without the deep pockets or, you know, the, the extended, you know, um, experience of having gone through a downturn before, which was like right. 2018. So are you, are you seeing deals kind of languish out, you know, for extended period of time while folks are trying to figure out the gap compared to, you know, I guess there was a time where deals kind of like closed, you know, relatively quickly, all deals have their problems. But since the pandemic, yeah, you know, we've had lumber costs skyrocket, labor costs skyrocket, and then you know, as of the last year, interest rates skyrocket. And um, have, have you any what type of negative effects, if any, have you seen on deals uh, themselves? Significantly slower in closing, right? And like even like from originations, like having the deal come in, us taking a look at it, multiple iterations of what that deal is going to look like. And I think the other thing is, you know, how long can you keep the thing? I know. It, I know a developer in Chicago, I was working on a deal and he was like, we must close by the end of this month because my GC just told me if we don't, he's going to redo his price. And so, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like there was like yeah. all these drivers and the same thing hitting the bond market. It impacted like whether or not we went Wednesday versus Thursday because the interest rate was different. Like it is, it is a very sensitive time, uh, I think for developers and what they're facing. And I think what, we try to do it in the app is try to like lessen that that variability that makes it difficult to kind of put your finger on whether or not you can get a thing closed. Um, now we only have so much control, right? And I think the other thing is our investors like the yield requirements going up because interest rates are going up. And so like, of course, they could put their money elsewhere. They can invest elsewhere. So why stick to us? And those yield requirements negatively impact, right? The price that we're able to provide to our sponsors and so we're very cognizant of that, making sure that 
you know, call it the full breadth of products that developers ask for or need, or, you know, pre-development lending, what is the price? Perm lending, what's the price? Like, what do things cost before you can say, yeah, you have the product, but it's not, it's not viable, right? Because mm -hmm. it's too expensive or it's too, um, it's not going to make the project work. And I think a lot of, you know, penciling in is happening and a lot of changes are happening where, you know, places like DC, where they have gap financing is like critical for folks to keep moving projects forward. Um, and projects are still getting done. Things are still getting built. And, you know, to your point, like, you know, things aren't slowing down, but who's getting it done? And if you pay attention, it's the big, the big players that have been around a long time with deep pockets. And sometimes that puts others in a disadvantage. Um, you guys, uh, I know on the debt side, for sure, in addition to the fact that the interest rates are going up, there's been a little bit of tightening on the underwriting of sponsors and things of that nature, you know, network, liquidity. Uh, have you guys tightened up some standards for the uh, sponsors when they come to you? So, you know, we're kind of the middleman, right? So um, we go by what our investor wants. And so it depends. It depends on the investor. Have, have they tightened up? In some cases, yes. Yeah. Some investors are like, no, we haven't filled this need. We're, we'll accept this or we'll accept that. We also have a Black and um, Indigenous Person of Color Fund, right? And specifically, that is supposed to basically bridge the gap for people of color um, who can't historically get these deals because they don't have the financial wherewithal, they may not have the experience, they may have related real estate experience, but not necessarily directly live set. And so we have a fund specifically for that. But what I'm finding is hard to place is because a lot of folks are saying, we can't even get the QAP because the experience points are so high. And so right. like, where do we start in terms of building that pipeline up? basically bridge the gap and see more people of col color building their communities. Yeah, we've done uh, some prior podcasts and you know, I'm involved with an organization called The Collective for Black and Brown Developers. And obviously it's the access to capital is one thing, but the experience requirements are another. And it almost forces the, uh, the minority developer to have to joint venture with bigger developers. And that's the path to scalability, but that's also the path of giving up you know, the majority of your developer fee and all that stuff as you're trying to build these resume points. Yeah, it's hard, right? And I think the other thing is like, even with the fund that we're looking at, the benefit of it is, I, I think the biggest benefit is usually the guarantee backstop because when yes. I said this to developers, I'm like, look, at the end of the day, like it's great to JV with people, but if they're going to keep taking a developer fee, how are you ever going to build your own financial wherewithal to go to a lender and say, now I have, I, I have developers with 10 years experience. But have never done a deal by themselves because yeah. that, they've never been able to take the majority of a developer fee. And I think that, right. like, as we talk about it more and you need know, these for profit or even not for profit, you know, really strong developers start seeing like a pushback of being like, well, if you're going to go in half and these people are from these communities and you're taking and you're coming in, you need to be splitting that developer fee 50 50, not 70 30 or whatever right. this is that people can really build up. Unless, or unless you're going to keep them under your thumb the entire time, which is not helpful whatsoever, right? Because then it, they, they'll keep building the experience, but they'll never have that financial stability right. to basically go out to a lender and say, I, I want this. So you said that program, you do some type of a guarantee, you said backstop with the term? Yeah, like basically we'll like NEF's guaranteeing the performance of this developer. Okay. And so like, you know, we put our balance sheet behind it. And I think that's a huge deal for developers. But here's the, here's the, you know, everything has its positive and negatives. And this is my little tag that's, that drives me a little crazy is that you have to have an award, right? Mm -hmm. We're a syndicator. So sure. the challenge is the Chicken reason we're doing it. We're not yeah. doing it at the kindness of our heart rate. We're doing it because we know that there's a gap. We know that there's a, you know, something that we want to accomplish here. But if you require some of these folks who have the application already, there, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more challenging because some of them are like, listen, you know, I want to do this, but I don't have the experience. Some of them are like, I have the experience, but I have nothing in terms of financials. And I have never been able to win an award by myself. And so even folks that we talk to, you know, HFAs, they're saying, yeah, no, we see the same people winning the awards. Yes. You know, like that's like consistent across the board, right? You're seeing yeah. the same players. And so even in DC, for instance, when we look at the 9% allocations and who's won them, you're, I'm seeing Boston clients that I know, big names, all up and down the coast, coming into DC because they know they can get deals done there. 
and mm -hmm. you're that those are opportunities lost to other folks that want to do deals sure. in my opinion right like uh, how sure. dc chooses it and how they balance the point system and you know trying to make some some pathways for people to get to is yeah. up to them but ultimately this is the result and i think that's a challenge no matter where you are last thing i would say and Curry could jump in from a developer aspect and we talked about the challenges of you know interest rates and and labor things of that but obviously the, the second half of that is the time it takes to complete the building lease it up and hitting those um those marks where you're not throwing yourself into a negative adjuster and, and i don't know if you run into or or how MEF has dealt with that because there have you know been delays supply chain delays as well then does that actually start hitting the, the actual equity in, in terms of negative adjusters yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we saw it during COVID, right? Like for sure, there was a lot of adjustments made. Um, I think yeah. for, you know, like I was working in New York during COVID and, you know, there was an instance where a developer at no fault of his own building was ready, but could not get utilities hooked up to the site. Took over a year. Okay. And so everything impacted, like from there, it was a ripple effect of like, you know, mm. you're, you're not meeting this. You need a year yep. of on your loan. That costs more money. You need to right size your interest reserve by $1.5 million, whatever it is, before you know we can fund any more dollars into this deal. And then it's, I mean, the ripple effect of that, of the like not making your hurdles on time is huge. It's why you have the adjusters in there because they know how critical it is because you're promising a certain yield. If you don't make it, you're not making that. And so there's, you know, that's a, it's just an offset. But at the same time, it's a huge hit. It's a huge hit when that doesn't happen. And 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 it's not necessarily at the fault of any one specific thing that was done. It's just like the market is what it is. And you're kind of waiting and you're you're doing your best and you're pushing and all these things. And lenders are just gonna say, hey, these are this is what is our loan agreement. Exactly. So you have to really make sure you're negotiating your loan documents and negotiate those adjusters, making sure that timing fits. Because what I also find is like people are really pushing. Um and being a little bit aggressive in terms of lease up or whatever the case is. And you almost want to make sure you have room and cushion, right? Because you want to make sure like, hey, if something happens, I don't want this negatively impacting my money. I want to make sure like, but time is money. The more time, you, more cushion you put on, that impacts your construction interest. Right? <laughs> but you got to put more budget and reserves for construction. So yeah. it's it's a cost benefit analysis like anything else, right? And so I think the the critical piece is really making me make it make sense for you and um you know i think most folks will work with you during those kind of difficult moments of i don't know any single deal in affordable housing that's always gone to no such thing as plans no. right like no. I, tell people, I tell people if it was so easy everybody truly would be doing it there's a reason why the big guys are the ones who keep getting the, the allocation absolutely so. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you have to work with folks that you feel have integrity and feel like you they will work with you. Right. Cause I think the same thing with lenders, like, um, you know, some lenders are like, nah, you're going to work out. We're not dealing with this. And some yeah. lenders are like, look, we've been doing business a long time. So from our perspective, we know that you'll get through this. We'll get you the extension, but you're going to have to right size this. And so, right. you know, perm loans go down, things happen, like whatever the case is, but gaps usually get filled by a deferred developer fee. And so sure. if you're a smaller shop, yeah. that's going to hit you different. <laughs> Sure, you're not going to have much of a developer fee at all. Exactly for all that work. <laughs> you go ahead, Kirvin. <laughs> exactly. I'm just, I'm just thinking. I'm when does more. when should someone approach approach NEF? Do you guys do workforce housing? Do, what what what's a what's your typical deal size? Yeah, I mean, you know, think of us like any affordable housing deal. We're open to look at. We'd like a minimum of five million. Um, you know, but I look at rural deals, right? I cover Virginia, I cover Maryland. Like there's definitely a lot of rural space that I, you know, would be about 5 million is what I hope because you have to think about who is our end investor, which is Freddie. And so they're thinking about, okay, well, um, you have duty to serve, you know, there's some, some programs that'll benefit some rural type of transactions, but then we go up, there's not really a limit. It was almost like syndicating, like, um, just thinking about what investors go together, trying to figure out what the right size is, um, phased phase projects, whatever the case is, but we do pre-development. So the earlier is always going to be better, right? Because if you need a pre-development loan, um, tied to a project, right? You want to make sure that we have all the information early on. Um, we do workforce housing, 
preservation, like I said. So on the back end, there's definitely products as well. Um, and, you know, like I said, if you have questions, it's really about, to me, it's the integrity of your relationship. So you want to create a relationship as soon as possible with many lenders. I'm not saying this for any app. I'm saying like it, it benefits you to know many people who will finance your project. Because if someone's not interested, there may be someone here that you already know that have a relationship with you. They don't have to vet you. They don't have to see where your liquidity net worth is. They know where you're at. Um, they feel comfortable with the deals that you've done. They've seen your projects, right? You might not have something in the pipeline right now, but let me go Let me go walk your site. Let me see you know, the type of work that you do and how it's maintained. And that will make other lenders feel more comfortable, right? So I think the, the sooner the better to just create relationships with folks is what I always recommend to people. What's the pre-development amount typically? Uh, like two, two and a half. Wow. I think the average pre-development, you know, it depends on what you need, but like uh, 500 a, uh, a million and the max is like two, two and a half. It depends on how big you are too, right? Your financial wherewithal will, will determine like how big they can go. Because I think we've gone up to 4 million, but that goes up to the board to get, you know, approval and the, the folks have a pretty strong financial statement. Yeah. So you're collateralizing probably the, the, uh... Certainly, the guarantor, I imagine, for the pre-development loan. You also take a position on the property, or how do you? Uh, kind of... Yeah, the guarantor. Yeah, guarantor. so okay. it really is. It comes down to the guarantor strength for the pre-development funds. Yeah, got it. Good to know. Yeah. And then, like when you're when we're underwriting like a new sponsor that we haven't worked with before, right? We're looking at financials. We're looking at your REO. We're looking at your previous projects, almost like a resume, right? Of like your pipeline and kind of what you have and then what you've done. Um, so think about like selling yourself, right? Like this is what, this is what we've been doing. This is how I know my neighborhood. This is where, you know, even when you're an established developer, like a Boston developer going to DC, what experience do you have in DC? Are you partnering with somebody in DC? Like those are the type of questions people are going to automatically want to know. Um, so they feel like you have the support necessary to be successful in a different market. Cause to Steve's point, they're not all the same and they don't all function the same. And I think that's going to be a different kind of challenge for people. Everyone's trying to figure out Stephanie, like we're where the market is, is going to go. How, how is, for those that just get into affordable housing, like how, and you've been in the industry, been in the game for a while, how does affordable housing fare during recessions generally? Well, honestly, um, in 08, like we were busy, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, it goes to show you where our government lands, like legislatively, right? They're focused on making sure like when things seem down, um, that they're doubling down on the, the ability for people to have affordable access to affordable housing. Now, whether or not that happens is a different thing, but deals don't necessarily slow down. It's just because in a downturn, more people need affordable housing. Yep. So it's hard, right? Like you're almost like trying to balance that part um, of there are more people in the streets, there's more people homeless, there's more people like pay, paycheck to paycheck or, you know, laid off. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see uh, with the tech industry, what's going on, but with interest rates, it seems like it's leveling out. Like I know the, you know, I think that they think the Fed is going to slow down a little bit on the increases. Um, inflation, I don't know. It'll be interesting. I mean, like I said, if I could predict and you get be the economist, I'd be making different types of money, Kevin. <laughs> 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 and you guys, uh, you, you guys play in the charter school space as well? We don't play in the charter school space, Kevin. Yeah. But, you know, like, I have some friends still in the space, like if there's, you know, this is why it's always good to know people and then kind of check your network. So mm -hmm. CDT is still doing charter schools. There's a lot of, there's a lot of lenders that have kind of backed away. Bank of America's not even doing charter schools anymore. Yep. So, yep. It's just, you know, trying to find the CDFI lender that is still doing charter schools, right? And kind of making sure that you have some diversity in that, in that pool of relationships. I know a lot of these, uh, you know, similar companies, NEF have like faith-based lending or faith-based yep. programs? you guys have something similar? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think our next iteration of like what we're focused on is like the healthcare space. We keep seeing like stuff where, you know, um, healthcare providers want stuff for potentially their nurses or like, you know, the workforce housing is like encroaching on healthcare workers and like making sure that affordable housing is within like a reasonable time frame to get to work. Um, so we're seeing like this, this desire to create a fund, um, like maybe United Healthcare or like, you know, some healthcare providers and insurance yep. providers um, that potentially would differentiate our investor pool from um, the typical banks. Yeah, I saw CVS has something. And um, I mean, Amazon being in the world is kind of, yeah. crazy, you know, yeah. all that money. So there's a lot of different, 
there's a lot of different sources that are coming in. And I think that's exciting for developers to think about, like, yeah. you know, it's not just your typical. We're doing uh, in Philadelphia, that's kind of what we're doing. There's a demand, we're right near, we're in the Opportunity Zone uh, near Temple Hospital and med Medical School. And they, they want their nurses and employees to live in that community. So we're looking at affordable uh, for sale housing, but everything is more like 80% to 120% AMI, which of course is above you know, tax credit equity stuff. But the missing middle is, is the big conversation that's going on too. And I don't know how to, that's going to really get addressed. At, at some point. It's a huge conversation, but I think the challenge with it is really like, you know, the LIHTC doesn't play with air, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. so, and I think a lot of developers are thinking about like, well, um, you know, it's, it's naturally occurring affordable. Right. And there are projects like that, but like, mm -hmm. you know, recapitalizing those kind of projects, like how are you thinking about, you know, basically maintaining that project, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's, I think that's interesting to do because even developers that are like taking over projects and wanting to maintain it as naturally occurring affordability, getting lenders comfortable with the fact that you'll just do that because you're mission driven is, you know, another piece of the puzzle. How are you guys looking at energy tax credits, Stephanie, like EV charging station, solar? I think some investors are still interested in energy. Um, we'll do solar. We haven't seen a lot of them, honestly, Kervin. Like there's the 45L credit that we've seen a little bit. It's just like, it's so small mm -hmm. uh, part of the deal. Like we have to find, you know, when I say we, meaning syndicators have to find that like right investor that's like, yeah, that's the current, you know, that's the size. So are that, is that small banks, regional, small regional banks, which we see is, a whole other issue that had popped up, right? Like, is the small regional bank safe enough? And mm -hmm. more people like pulling their money out, whatever the case is. So um, I think for the energy credits, like there's a big focus on it, but I don't know that the right investor is, is like readily available for folks. Um, so we've got to be a little bit creative about the solutions there. I mean, I know so, you like to get historic tax credit or- Historics as well, but historics are, again, it's just depending on who's interested in the historics, right? Like historics are, yeah, it's just placing it with the right folks. I almost think of myself as like a dating service, right? Like you tell me what, <laughs> you, what you want. I talk to so-and-so and they tell me, yeah, that fits with me or doesn't fit with me. And then like, that is the job, right? To make sure that I can place you and match you. So that it's a good relationship going forward. Yeah. And, you know- potentially make sure that the pipeline is strong so that that continues um on yeah so this is uh this is this is good information stuff i was just in your hometown of puerto rico as you know uh we're seeing a lot of light tech projects pop up in puerto rico now you had a chance to do any work there um any i've definitely done work there i haven't had a chance um but i think it's great honestly we had a lot of puerto rico deals at bank of america before you know, 08, but then Lehman Brothers was an investment back then. Like there was a lot of, a lot of stuff that went sideways. So it's good to see um, in Puerto Rico, some of that happening. I think, you know, obviously, you know, Kerbin, like they, they have a lot of hurricane impact. Yeah. So yeah. Kind of focusing on rebuilding is going to be the kind of primary. People are awesome. That was beautiful to see some of the neighborhoods come back. Good yeah. Stuff. yeah. Staff, I'm always appreciate it. Thank you, Kerbin. Thanks for including me. Absolutely. Steve, it was oh, for sure. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Take Have care. Bye. Take care now. All right, Bye. guys. Another day at the shop. Content they can't get anywhere else.